The message this morning I've titled Love One Another. You know, I don't know, we've been going through this book of John, and of course, if you've read the Gospels and you see the story, you know, it all centers around Jesus and his ministry on earth, and really, as just as close with that, is all of these interactions that happen between him and his disciples. We have these 12 disciples. And I, you know, the, the Bible sometimes gives you a little glimpse and insight into different disciples' character. Of course, we always see Peter. He's kind of out front, in front of everyone, saying what's on his mind. Uh, sometimes we like to say he puts his foot in his mouth. I don't think that's always true, but nonetheless, uh, that's, that's kind of the reputation he's been given. We think of Thomas, we think, well, he's the guy that was the, the doubter. He didn't really believe when Jesus was resurrected, and, you know, he must have been going through all of this ministry. Maybe he had that sense of you know, questioning everything, or I got to see it for myself type of attitude. You don't know. Uh, you know, we, we tend to paint a picture in our mind for each of these disciples. And of course, Judas Iscariot, we all have a picture of him. Uh, he was that guy that, you know, he basically skulked through three years of ministry so that he could deceive Jesus in the end. Uh, that's kind of what we picture, we paint for him. And uh, I don't know, I, you know, the other ones, a lot of times these are like, well, these are just names that I can't pronounce and we don't know anything about them. So uh, we just kind of, you know, paint the rest of them all in a group. And I don't know if you've ever thought about, you know, 12 guys plus Jesus living together, traveling on the road, being in ministry for three plus years. Have you ever thought about what type of interaction they must have had with each other? Uh, what type of relationships they may have had with each other? Um, do you think it was always good, happy times, telling jokes, slapping each other on the back, and you know, just enjoying each other's company and fellowship all the time? Uh, I mean, some of us maybe think, yeah, it was kind of like, you know, maybe Robin Hood and his merry men that we're all just uh, you know, all in it together, you know. Uh, and, and I think we sometimes maybe have a wrong perception if that's what we think. Because the fact is, I don't care who you are, you don't put 12 of anybody together for an extended period of time without there being problems. <laughs> now, we don't get a lot of that reported to us in Scripture, but I think we see a little glimpse here in this little passage as to one of the needs that was happening amongst Jesus and his disciples. Because Jesus begins in verse 12, again, he's teaching to his disciples. He just got through speaking to them about how they needed to abide in him. He's the true vine, and they need to find their strength and find their being and relationship with him as first and foremost. And then he follows this up quickly in verse 12 with this thought. He says, this is my commandment. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment. You know, we don't make commands for people or things or situations where there's no need, right? You think about this, you know, um, I think about um, driver's ed. You know, when I, years ago, we used to take, um, the driver's instructor used to sit in the other side of the car. And you had this specially outfitted car, right? And it had, um, I guess some of the real fancy one had an actual steering wheel in them, but I've never seen one of those. But they, certainly the guy that I had, he had an extra brake pedal, right? <laughs> he had a brake pedal on his side. So if things got too far out of hand, he could at least get the car stopped, right? Uh, because the fact is, I remember um, uh, one of the, one of the, times that we went out driving and there were a couple of us in the car together and uh you know i did my turn somebody else did there we were out somewhere in the middle i don't know where we were at exactly quite far from home and it had just begun to snow and there was maybe a, maybe a quarter inch or so of snow on the ground and it was just starting to snow we had this car stopped and this girl gets up and it's her turn to get in the driver's seat right and you could tell this was her first time riding in this position. Uh, she had not understood anything about the steering wheel or the gear shift or any of the turn signals or anything. And she was in there looking over all these levers and knobs and dials in the front. And she was, you could tell, she was a little overwhelmed. And uh, he, he began to explain, okay, well, this is the turn signal. And, you know, here's how you... Here's how you get the car started, and here's your gas and your brake, and you know gas makes you go, and and so it was like ground zero, right? Snowy roads, right? Now remember where we're at. <laughs> he says now, he says now we need to. 
you know, put the car in, uh, in drive and we need to give it some gas and start down the road and this and that. And the, late, the girl puts this thing in drive and she steps on the gas the whole way to the ground. <laughs> and she starts steering. <laughs> and the next thing we know, the car is doing this, a 360. And he starts hollering out, brake, brake, brake. And it, there's no braking going on. She's doing all the driving, not a lot of braking. Luckily, he had the way to get the brake and the car stopped. And she had a short trip and somebody else had a turn. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the fact is, if, he, if she knew what the brake was, he wouldn't have been having to tell her to brake, right? <laughs> The instructions came because there was a lack of that going on. And uh, they were coming very emphatically and nonetheless not actually working so well. Um, and I think this is where we're at with the story with Jesus and his disciples. Sometimes we tend to be so far removed from the situation that we say, Oh, isn't that nice? Jesus is telling everybody, Hey, just keep loving each other. You guys, you know, we're all such good. You know what? I think these guys needed to be told. I think these guys needed to be told, hey, Jesus, this isn't just a recommendation from him. <laughs> he doesn't just say, hey, boys, you know, you ought to love each other. That's a good thing to do. No, he says, boys, you need to understand how important this is. <laughs> this is my commandment. This is an important instruction that you've got to understand. You've got to love one another. And as disciples and as my my men that are going to represent me and build the church upon me, you've got to represent something that the world doesn't have. And that is a love for each other because nobody's going to look at 12 guys wandering through three years of ministry and expect them to come out all friends. <laughs> he says, but I need you to understand this is a commandment that you love one another. And you know, love is such a misunderstood concept today. <laughs> Our world has corrupted and redefined and changed it into their own understanding of what love is all about. And so I want us to, as we look through this passage this morning, to understand some things about the love that we are to have for one another as Christians, as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ. The first thing that we see of course, that we've mentioned already in verse 12, is that love is a command. That tends to be, you know, antithetical sometimes in our minds. Well, love is a feeling, or love is a, you know, it's, a, it's something that comes over me. No, Jesus says, this is my commandment. This is a commandment for you. The first observation I make about this verse is that love is not just an emotion or a feeling. We tend to first begin to characterize, if you said, hey, tell me about all the, the emotions and feelings that we have as human beings. And probably one of the first things that will bubble to your list is, well, we have love. Love's in a feeling. Love's an emotion. And, of course, there is an emotional component. There is a, 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 a feeling to love that comes along. But primarily, especially in this context, when we're talking about loving one another, it's not just some force that comes over us. It's not just something that we succumb to. It's like, oh, this, ah, oh, I feel love. You know, I've, I feel it. I sense it. I've, it just kind of floods over me. No, this isn't what Jesus is. This isn't what he's talking about. This isn't like Cupid hitting you with some arrow and, oh, I've just got no, no, no sense about me. I've got to just, you know, be full of love now. No, he says this is a commandment. And love, therefore, is something that doesn't just come and go as, you know, the weather changes or as the politics change or whatever. <laughs> the fact is love is something that is meant to be a consistent choice that we make. Because if Jesus commanded us to love one another, then he expects us to be able to make that choice as to whether we will love or whether we won't love. It's something we have to decide for ourselves, whether we will obey that commandment or we won't obey. So that's the first observation, that love is a command. And the second observation of this is maybe a corollary to it, and that is this, that love for each other doesn't always come naturally. Our love for each other doesn't always come, you know, as part of who we are. <laughs> it, it may not always be something that we feel like doing. 
Sometimes we are commanded to do things, and we do them because they are the right thing to do. They're the best thing to do. They're maybe not just best for other people, but we know that they're best for us. And we do them because we have chosen to do them, not just because they naturally are uh, are a part of what we would have chosen to do on our own. In other words, Jesus knew that we needed to be commanded. (laughs) He knew that we were in need of that because it wasn't going to be a natural uh, natural consequence. And... uh, The fact is, and the truth is, even in the church today, and again, I'm not just talking about us, I'm talking about believers in general, but certainly within the context of local churches, I can tell you that some of the worst hating, (laughs) grudge-filled problems between people I've seen happen within the context of believers. (laughs) You know, and that's a sad commentary on where we're at at fulfilling this verse, verse 12. Because the fact is, we are not always wanting to love each other. And the fact is, others are not always easy for us to love. (laughs) We find people in our lives that God's put in front of us, and we say, how can I ever love this person? (laughs) You know, this person doesn't see the way I see it. This person doesn't do things the way I would do them. This person, you know, I, I know is a believer... But, boy, they're not somebody that, you know, I get along with. And we tend to write this off because we say, oh, well, that's, um, you know, that's just the way it is. He doesn't expect me to love people that, you know, are just miserable or people that are mean to me or people that have done me wrong or people that have, you know, whatever it is, people that have a chip on their shoulder. (laughs) We say, oh, well, I don't have to do that. But you know what the fact is? The Bible doesn't discriminate. Jesus doesn't say, I want you to love one another that you can get along with. He doesn't say to his disciples, I want you to love one another, but not Judas, because we know where he's going. He says, I I want you to love one another, except not Peter when he sticks his foot in the mouth and makes his law look bad. No, he, he didn't say that. He said, we just need to love one another indiscriminately without without the barriers being put up, without the excuses being given. And he gives it to us as a command. Now, um, the second part then, let's look at verse 13. So he gives us this command, and then he gives us this example. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, We all know, 2,000 years later, if we've been good students of the Bible and we've gone to Sunday school, we know what Jesus was referring to here. He's referring to his own sacrifice. He's referring to the fact that he would be giving his life for the benefit of all mankind. He was going to demonstrate his love to us in that way. And so this was an example of how Christ was going to demonstrate his love. At this point in time in John, uh, this hadn't occurred yet. So this is uh, still looking at the future. Uh, But what is he really telling his disciples about the nature of love? That sometimes love requires sacrifice. Sometimes love requires sacrifice. It's not just a command, and sometimes that command is going to require us to give up something of great value even to our own selves in order to fulfill this command because that is why ultimately Christ decided to sacrifice his, tr- sacrifice his own life. Have you ever thought about this? You know, we obviously just went through the Easter season and we talk about the events of the crucifixion and we talk about the events of what happened and how we can have our faith in those things. But did you ever ask yourself, what is it that really motivated the Lord? What is it that motivated Jesus Christ to go to the cross? The Bible tells us it's his love. It's his love for us that was so great that he decided to sacrifice his own life for. And that's why he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now I have a question. What is it that we have done that made it so that Christ would love us? Think about it. (laughs) Not a thing. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, it says this about 
this whole situation. It says, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says we've had no reason for Christ to love us. We have, we have nothing that is lovely about us in our sin. And yet the Bible says while we were yet sinners, that's when Christ died for us because of his love. You see, Christ didn't love us because we were lovely. He didn't love us because he wanted us to, you know, just show him that love. No, he loved us because he chose to love us. He chose to do that in the same way he commands us to love one another. He chose to do it and he did it and he gave his sacrifice for us despite the fact, not because of, but despite the fact that we have done nothing for him. We've done nothing to deserve his sacrifice on the cross. We had shown him no love. The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead people don't do much. We didn't do much to show Christ love. We have done nothing to deserve that love that he gave us. And so the question is, what does that do to inform our understanding of how we are to love each other? Because if we're going to love like Christ, if we're going to use this example that he gave us and follow this command to love one another, the fact is to love like Christ means we may have to sacrifice something for that other person to demonstrate our love. And we may have to sacrifice something for that other person even if they've done nothing to deserve it. We may have to make a sacrifice to show our love to someone even if they aren't appreciative of it. You ever have give somebody something and they say, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, great. <laughs> Just what I wanted. <laughs> you keep the receipt. <laughs> <laughs> we always like to you have these gift receipts now, you know. You go to the store and, oh, well, I'll give you the, give the gift receipt. Because... Not everybody's going to be appreciative of what you've bought them, right? They might just want to send it back to J.C. Penney or wherever they got it and, and get something else. The fact is, we know, we've all experienced times when we've tried to show love to someone and it's been met with, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really care. Or, I, don't, I don't really want what you've got. But does that make our decision to love any less important? No. In fact, it demonstrates Christ's love. Christ sacrificed. He gave his love to us when we weren't capable of appreciating what he did for us. And yet he still did it. So sometimes to show people love, we must sacrifice. And we do that even if they've done nothing to deserve it or if they're not appreciative of it. And they, we eat, need to do it even if they never love us back because of it. That's a hard one. But think about Christ. How many people did he die for? Everyone. <laughs> How many people have truly loved him back because of what he did? Not a lot. <laughs> the Bible says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. The fact is, there's few people that are going to truly appreciate or truly love Christ for what he did for them. But the fact is, when we see people and we try to show them love and they don't show us any love back, do you know what we start to do? Well, I'm writing them off. I've had enough of them. I put, my, put myself out there and they didn't, they didn't return the favor. You know what? They don't get any more of my love. I'll invest in people that are going to love me back because it's all about what does love happen? What, what, what does our love about if that's true? Our love isn't about giving. If you're only loving someone because you want something back out of it, what are you doing? You're loving to build your own self up. I need some love back. So I'm going to give some because I want some in return. It's an investment, right? <laughs> I'm investing and I'm hoping I get more back than I sent. Because I need some, right? I need some of that in my life. You know, if that's what we see love as, not as a sacrifice, we haven't truly understood what Christ's love for us is all about. So love is a command, 
And love may require sacrifice. Let's look at the next couple of verses in verse 14 and 15. He says, follows this with, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. My next thought from these couple of verses is this, that love is not simply a service that we provide. Love is not just simply some type of service. You know, it's easy for us to think about these first two thoughts and become very mechanical, very um, formal in the sense that we are loving people. Um, he says, love is a command. All right, I'm a robot. I take commands. I do my thing, you know. Love is a sacrifice. All right, I'm going to do the right thing because I love the Lord and he told me to sacrifice. Sometimes I'm going to have to love people that don't love me and that's my thing. And we can become very roughshod about our love, can't we? And so Jesus turns this around and he says, you, you, you disciples need to understand one thing about this commandment. I'm asking you to love one another and I'm recognizing that it's a command and it's going to be a sacrifice, but you can't allow yourself to... To, to live this out in front of other people as though you are just some kind of servant that has no ability to make, uh, to make his own decisions. <laughs> he says, you're my friends. He says, you're my friends. You're, you're, you're people that are, that are part of my close family. You're, you're adopted in. You're, you're people that are, that are going to be, um, uh, you know, not just the servants in my household. You've got a closer relationship than this. And it's not, you, can't, you can't truly love someone if you just say, well, this is just part of my Christian duty. <laughs> this is part of my Christian service that I have to perform because God told me to do it. No, that's not really true. It may be easy to think that since love is a command and it can require a sacrifice, that it's just a duty because we're God's servants. Jesus makes sure that we understand we aren't doing this just because we're God's servants. Because love has to be born out of the relationship that we have with Jesus himself. And it has to be motivated by our friendship with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now that's a friend. <laughs> they sometimes say blood is thicker than water, but you know what? We have both. <laughs> we have both with the Lord. We have his friendship and we have his blood. We're born into his family and he calls us friends. And the fact is, if we're truly to love others, we have to be motivated by that relationship that we have. And so, therefore, you know, I think sometimes our love for other people does get cold and mechanical because that's what our relationship with Christ is all about. Is our relationship with Christ all about duty and service? Is it cold and mechanical? Some, some of us have it down in our Christian life. I do this, I do that, I drink my coffee, I do my, I write my prayer list, I have this, I do that, you know, and we become very mechanical in our living for the Lord. And maybe we're doing all the right things, but where's our heart in it? Have we lost our heart devotion to the Lord? Because if our relationship with Christ is all mechanical and cold, our love for each other is going to be the same way. It's only going to be about service. Our true love for each other will either be expressed as a mere duty or service, or it will be a, based upon a love that we're acting from. So our love must be born from a heartfelt remembrance of that love that brought us into a place of friendship with Christ. That's what he's reminding of his disciples there. So let's continue, verses 16 and 17. 16 and 17. He says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. It's like the capstone to the whole passage. Starts out with the command, and he ends us with the command. And what do we see in these two verses? One last thing about love that he tells us. When we truly love one another, he says, love will bear fruit. Love will bear fruit. He says, you've not chosen me, 
He says that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. You see, it's true heartfelt love that we have for one another that's going to ultimately be a great part of our testimony and witness to the world around us. It's going to be when people see that there's a real connection, that there's a reality of love within your midst, that you're going to say, I've got something different in my life. You know, we, we, we probably don't do as well as we should at sharing our faith with others. The fact remains, that's true. I'm not here to preach about that this morning. But the fact is, we don't do well at that. But I will tell you, one of the reasons when we do try to be a witness that we aren't effective at it is because we haven't shown love in it. People don't see anything different about our lives than other people around us. Why do I want your God? Why do I want to go to your church? Why do I want to believe in your Bible? It's no different than believing in everything else. And you know what? I get to go live and have my fun and do my, do my life the way I see fit. The fact is... If you want your witness and your testimony to bear fruit and that your fruit would remain, in other words, be something that will be there consistently, it's something that you've got to demonstrate, that people don't see you and your faith as just some religion that gets you to heaven. It can't be something people see you as some religious, uh, you know, I go through the motions every week. James 1 puts it this way. (laughs) James 1.27, he says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, this has always been a little bit of an enigma scripture because you say, well, is this really all I have to do, visit fatherless people and widows, and that's what all God expects of me? No, it's more than that. But this is an example What is James explaining to us about our love for other people? People that are fatherless, orphans, and widows, what do they have to give back? Not much. They're the ones that are in the greatest need. When we begin to show love and sacrifice and live out this command to love one another before the people who are the least able to reciprocate anything in in return, then we've understood the purity, the truth of what it is that we believe, of the love that we have from the Lord. Because isn't this exactly what God did for us when he sent his son? He sent his most valuable son in human form to die a death that he did not deserve in order that people who would not even care about it could someday come to him and be in a relationship with him. Why does God want a relationship with us? (laughs) That's one question I'm going to ask him someday. (laughs) I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. But God desires a relationship with us because the Bible says, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you realize God loves the world and he loves all of the whosoevers? (laughs) And there's a lot of whosoevers out here. (laughs) We meet them every day in the street. (laughs) And we say, boy, how could God love them? (laughs) Boy, you know, I can't love them. How does God? But the Bible says God does. He did. And he still does. And even these whosoevers that we say, I've got to just stay away from. God says, I sent my son for them. What does that inform us about how we are to live? To love one another. Our love for one another is where we visibly show how the Lord's love for us has changed our heart. So we can truly love one another the way we need to. There's lots of things that stand in our way. People have done wrong to us. You know, the old adage is still true in church as it is in families and workplace environments. Familiarity breeds contempt. (laughs) And a lot of churches are filled with people who have been around each other quite a long time, many years. We have a lot of history, and history doesn't always uh, bring you closer. Sometimes the history's brought you apart. 
And the problem is, when we begin to let that commandment to love one another go, we've lost what it is that Christ wants us to be and how he wants us to live. You know, many years ago, I think I've told you this illustration before, but many years ago, um, there was a war in um, Bosnia, current, what used to be Yugoslavia, before it got broken up. Maybe you remember it in the mid-90s, early 90s. And uh, in that country, there were uh, there's three factions, three main factions. One was, they were like Orthodox Christians, one were like Roman Catholic Christians, and one were like um, um, Islam. They were like Islamic. And there were like three factions. And you would think, you know, um, some of them would at least be able to get along, but they were very harshly divided along those lines. They were either one, one group or the other. You, you chose your side. It was a three-way fight. And uh, that, that's why it was so ugly in Yugoslavia. And in Bosnia, um, it was especially bad in some of the places. There was obviously genocide that took place. You would see one group come in and just slaughter everyone in a village and, and put them to death. And there would be all kinds of, of mass graves that would be created from this. And then, of course, you'd see a retaliation for that. And this was, this was how the war ended up going. And by the mid-'90s, the, uh, the UN came in and said, we're going to put a peacekeeping mission in. And they tried, to, they tried to keep the peace. Well, I don't know how you keep the peace with three groups of people that hate each other. Because the fact is, they haven't solved any of the hate. <laughs> they may have reduced the number of bullets that were flying. But the fact is, the people still just hated each other. And uh, I went there in '96. I was one of, with a missionary, and we, uh, it's a long story, but the short story is this. I went there with a missionary. We were one of the first civilian groups that were allowed into the country after the fighting had ceased. The place was a disaster. I mean, every town you went to, the buildings were destroyed. It was rubble. I mean, I didn't live through World War II, but I've seen the pictures, you know, where there's just rubble everywhere after the aftermath. This is what it looked like. Every city you went to, one after another. Went to a, went to a, a church in uh, the city of Mostar. And uh, in Mostar was the, actually the biggest church of true Christians, true Bible-believing, born-again Christians in the entire country. And I think there were maybe, maybe two or three hundred people in this church. And uh, this, there was only, in the course of the whole country of about five million people, there were only maybe less than a handful of Bible-believing churches at all. Uh, and so this was the biggest church. This was, this was like the mother church of them all, I guess. And uh, it was a, still a dangerous place. Um, as we walked in, there was still um, uh, blood on the ground from places where churchgoers would be hit by snipers on their way to church in the morning because people didn't like the Christians either. But uh, I was there on Easter Sunday in 1996. And um, one of the things that the pastor who was there talked to me about, he says, you know, we have something very unique here in this church. I said, what's that? He says, well, he says, see those people over there? These are former Islam. They were Muslims who accepted Christ as their savior. And they've, they're, they're born again now. They're part of this church. And he says, you see those people over there? These were former Orthodox Christians. And they, they've accepted Christ as their savior. They're born again. They're part of our church now. He says, see these back here? The, these are some of the, the, uh, the Catholic folks that they've come to the Lord and they've accepted Christ and they've been born again and they're now part of our church. We have, we have pretty much an equal amount of all three of these different backgrounds all in our church. They come every week and they worship together and we sing God's praises together and we love the Lord. And he says, um, that's something that, that, you know, the rest of the country isn't seeing. <laughs> Because they won't even talk to each other. He says, in fact, we've got so much credibility. He says, the UN came to, my, came to me a, uh, and a number of months ago. And he said, he said, we noticed that you have all these different factions in here amongst yourself. And he said, we don't understand how you have them all in here meeting together. And they're not, you know, fighting with each other. And he says, well, you know, I had a chance to share the gospel with those people. <laughs> he says, and we told them that the fact is... The only reason these people are able to love each other now is because of the Lord's love for them. They've understood what it means to be born again. And he said, we worship. And he says, you know what? These people keep coming back 
These UN officials, these people that are trying to run the peace in this country, they keep coming back because they, they need to understand what the secret sauce is, the secret formula about our church that allows all these people to meet together when they have been so unsuccessful in doing it, spending millions of dollars and how many troops into this country. He said, the fact is, it's our love for each other and our love for the Lord that's made the difference. He says, and we've witnessed and we've seen people change and we continue to see that as the Lord opens those doors. You see, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> that is just how it's supposed to work. As people around us see our love for each other and see our love for the Lord, they are to then turn and see what the difference is about us. It opens the door for us to share our faith with them. That's why it's so important that this command is true for us. And so as we close this morning, I want you to think about just something in your own life. Think about that someone. Who is it that you're having trouble loving this morning? <laughs> Who is it? Think of the most unloveliest person <laughs> in your life. Think of that person who you just, they drive you the, the wrong way. <laughs> they just, there's just no getting along with them. Maybe there's someone who did you wrong. Maybe there's someone who just never shows you that love back. Maybe they're that someone who's just arrogant and just, you just can't get along with them because they, they never come down to your level. <laughs> I don't know who they are. Might be a family member. Might be someone here in our midst, in our church family. I want you to think about that person who you have neglected to love as the Lord has commanded you. Think about them. Either write them down on a piece of paper or just have them present in your mind. And I want you to make a commitment. Make a commitment this week. Number one, pray for that person. Pray for them every day this week. Just make, I'm, this is a one week commitment. That's all I'm asking. Pray for that person every day this week. If there's something between you and them that's unreconciled, maybe there's something that needs to be forgiven, go to that person. Seek that forgiveness. Work towards that reconciliation. Thirdly, I want you to choose something, whatever you want it to be, whatever you think is most meaningful and effective, Choose something, one thing for them this week that can demonstrate your love to them. I don't know what it is. Maybe, you know, you um, invite them out for lunch someday. Or maybe you, you know, I don't know. You, you have to decide what, what makes the most sense. Find that one person who you have the hardest time loving. Pray for them. Reconcile with them. And do something this week. To show them your love. You know that's just the first baby step. To really understanding. And living out this commandment. That Jesus is giving us. Because he makes it clear. Multiple occasions. These things I command you. That you love one another.